the Tavern Smiley is in the house. I'm giving shout outs. I've been linked to microphones for the last two weeks, so I have to say, let's recognize people who have helped us in this struggle. Um, we're so pleased and thankful that Dr. Emily Towns, Yale Divinity School community, the larger Yale University family, have been gracious enough to pull us all together. It is both an important occasion in the history of this country at this moment, but also it's like a family reunion. I haven't seen some people for 20 years who are here today. It is also excellent to see second and third generation womanists and black religious scholars who are doing their thing as professors and research scholars and head of foundations and institutions in the community. So truly, uh, the issue of black religion is alive and well. We have a great panel for you all. First of all, my name is Dwight Hopkins, and I'm professor of theology at the University of Chicago Divinity School and a proud member of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago. We have a, a brilliant panel before us uh, this afternoon in session two. And again, it is definitely a conversation panel, so we encourage you both the presenters, the sharers, and you, the audience, to take this in the mode and mood of being a conversation. Uh, we are gathered together to talk about the topic, when will we be able to stop pleading our case that we are human? Have black folk, have we moved beyond the stage of pleading our humanity? Are we talking about we are humans? Are we living into it? Or is there some other pursuit that we're, 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 we're taking? We have on our panel today Dr. Cheryl, Cheryl Townsend Jilts, who's the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Professor of Sociology and African American Studies at Colby College. We also have Professor Eddie Glaw, who's Associate Professor of Religion at Princeton University. Uh, professor Jonathan Holloway, who is a Professor of History, African American Studies, and American Studies here at Yale University. And Dr. Alondra Nelson, who is Assistant Professor of Sociology and African American Studies here at Yale University. So without further ado, we'd like to begin with remarks or sharing with Dr. Jill. Good morning again. The question, when will we, meaning black people, African Americans, be able to stop pleading our case? that we are human. The first part of my answer simply says, never. Let me explain what I mean. What, why am I saying never? Because I think that we are not fully human. I do believe we are fully human. That our ancestors let us know we were fully human when they said, if anybody asks you who I am, Tell them I'm a child of God. And so the sense of one's own humanity is not an issue. But, and I'm in the middle of working on an essay, but it's overdue for it. it's editing um, the story of my life, <laughs> on race and religion, for a handbook on race and ethnicity. Um, obviously, I'm adding a paragraph about the church to which I would belong if I lived in Chicago, <laughs> where we are reminded in a society that contests our humanity, and that is essentially the definition of race and racism. We're talking about contested humanity. And I use that phrase with my students when I talk about the issues of race and ethnicity in society. We're talking about contested humanity. Somebody's humanity is contested. Earlier this year, however, why do I say never? Uh, one of the things I say in the essay is that we are at the end of a half a millennium of racialization of the racialized world as shaped by the slave trade. However, I read Mark Redditor's book the slave ship. I recommend it. Because when you finish the book, if you are descended from someone who was enslaved in the Americas, you close that book and say, I am a descendant of someone who survived that. And 
as much as we have talked about the middle passage in the past, one does not understand the incredible social and economic apparatus that attended to the capture and coercion of black people until one reads this detailed discussion <coughs> of the ship, the equipment manufactured in order to do the shipping, and the experience of the people who were enslaved and placed on those ships and carried over, and the irony, because it developed a system that discarded all kinds of humanity. You know, including the white sailors who were on the ships, not willingly in most cases, who when captains found them sick or needed to cut down on the number of jobs in order to increase their profit, just dump them in the Caribbean, sick and ill, and who cared for them? The Africans, who they brought over, who knew how to heal their diseases. But what the book really, the way in which the book really shook me was that as a sociologist, and when we teach quote unquote intro sociology, we talk about the various problems that gave rise to the discipline of sociology, and we talk about the rise of capitalism, and the development of political revolutions in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. <laughs> what that book does, it says, uh -uh, you cannot tell that story that way anymore. The slave trade <coughs> defines, defines the foundations of capitalism. And what it says is that for the pursuit of profit and power, we have reached a stage in, 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 in human civilization where people who have the means will do whatever it takes in terms of destroying someone else's humanity to make money. So when I say never, it is not because I don't think that the project of establishing unquestioningly that we are fully human can't be completed. It is that once you understand how tenuous the definition of fully human is for anybody, then anyone who is descended from a history of contested humanity must, I think, take responsibility for making sure that the project of establishing one's humanity and others by extension can never, ever, ever be abandoned. It is a constant struggle. And I am descended from a people who Du Bois asked, what message do these people have for the world? The message is one must always attend to the project of establishing fully everyone's humanity to make sure that those who, do, who have the power and the means of control and coercion do not dismiss anyone's humanity. Because once you go after my humanity and you succeed at destroying mine, who's next? Who's next? And I, I, I'll stop there. But my answer is never. Okay. so wonderful to inhabit uh, space uh, with Dr. Cal. Louder. Say again? Oh, it's just so wonderful. I want to say that real loud. <laughs> it's so wonderful to inhabit space with Dr. Cal. And so uh, I'm, I'm so excited to be here with you. I'm so excited to be a part of this conversation, uh, a part of this panel. Uh, so let me begin uh, by saying it all depends on who's the we. <coughs> who's the we doing the please? And I want to say this because I've been thinking about Middle Passage, and we can 
think about this in terms of a historical moment, or we can think about it as a kind of metaphor for a period of transition, a movement between one space to another. And the subtitle of the conference is Black Religion and Human Life. And so part of what we have to begin to think about is not only um, uh, the question of Africans in the diaspora and how they are uh, enduring and experiencing uh, the shifting tides of, 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 of their circumstances, as it were. But we also have to think about what we're doing in our craft as scholars of African American religion or scholars of religion in the diaspora. So I want to begin there. So I'm going to make a distinction. Uh, we know that there are practices directed towards black folk uh, that strip them of their dignity and generally dishonor them. Uh, and to the extent to which those practices presuppose the dehumanization of African descended peoples, uh, part of the argument uh, when we make the case for uh, justice in relation to these unjust practices is to affirm that dignity and to affirm the order honor of their personality. And to that extent, uh, we're not pleading right, uh, the case of us being human. We're responding to a set of practices that dehumanize. Uh, I want to say something. That, uh, that The price of that ticket has been paid for me. I'm not pleading my humanity to anybody anymore. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So the price of that ticket has been paid. So I don't want to say, so part of when we are addressing uh, specific realities, whether it be so-called uh, uh, enclaves of, of, of the hyper-concentrated poor and how they're treated. Uh, whether it's black men and women treated as fodder for the prison industrial complex. Uh, whether it's uh, African American women stuck in violent domestic relationships. Uh, situations that result in uh, the dehumanization, uh, the stripping of dignity, and the generally, dis generally dishonoring of black bodies, we have to first affirm the humanity of those persons, of those persons with whom we have an intimate connection as we begin to speak to those unjust practices. That's the first. But what does it mean for us as scholars mm. to predicate our scholarship on the assumption that we have to plead for the humanity of black people? Now, I think that's a faulty proposition. I don't think we should begin there at all. But I think we should assume that. It's almost like David Walker in his 1829 appeal, refusing to engage in an argument with Jefferson's notes on the grounds of rationality. Right? Jefferson presumes that we can actually have a rational debate about whether or not we're human or not. And, and Walker says, you. Right? <laughs> Walker says, I'm not engaging on that. Matter of being engaged, but Walker's not going to engage in that kind of form, in that kind of debate. So part of it has to do with how do we imagine our scholarship, right, without having to first make good on the claim that we're human. How can we presuppose that? And moving to the second move, well, making the second move, that our scholarship, by engaging in a, a detailed description and account of the complex ways in which black folk navigate space and time, how that account then provides us with some insight into what it means to be human, as opposed to pleading our humanity. Does that make sense? So there's a sense in which when we read Russian literature, right, sometimes I don't get the jokes. When we read Irish literature, sometimes I might not get the references. But there's something in the particularity of the formulation that tell us something about what it means to make our journey from womb to tomb. So we move from the particular to the universal such that this literature, this body of work, gives us insight into the difficult task of being human and trying to make sense of the short time that we're here. So part of how we imagine our work is not so much engaged in the proactive claim of making the case that we are human. Rather, it involves engaging in a detailed account of the complexity of the journey of these people a lot of people as they try to make sense of their lives, and in making sense, they provide us with an insight into what it means to be human. You see the difference? And so part of what I want to say is that those days of scholars spending an inordinate amount of time trying to convince others that we are human, that ticket has been paid. 
I don't like that. I'm not writing that way. Now, that doesn't mean that we cannot assert uh, the importance of dignity. We cannot speak to the fact that folk are being generally dishonored. We cannot speak that in some instances, practices that are levied against black and brown and poor peoples suggest that some lives are worth more than other lives. And in the context of making the case against those practices, we assert the humanity of the folk for whom we care most about. We assert the humanity of a folk for whom we are deeply in love and to whom we serve. And so part of what I want to do is to kind of give, by way of summary, make a distinction. Who's doing the pleading? If we're pleading in our scholarship, I plead with you to stop pleading. If we're working on behalf of those who are locked out on the margins, we presume their humanity as we struggle for justice and equality. <laughs> It's getting more fun by the second, um, following these, these panelists. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I um, want to start with an apology. I don't mean to disrespect this session of panel, but I told Emily Towns earlier, I have to leave 10 minutes early because I'm hosting another event, um, which might have frankly poked somebody from the university and I have to introduce him. Um, so um, I will have to leave, but it has nothing to do with this conversation. I definitely want to be here for the whole, for the whole session. Um, I, I um, want to shift a little bit, only because I don't know what else there is to say after these powerful <laughs> presentations, but I want to shift to something um, rather personal in, this, in, in, in the expectation, frankly, to a story all of you already know. Two stories, um, and they are tied together in a way that I think will be clear by the time I end the second one. The first one, when I was on the job market for the first time, actually I landed my first job, I was teaching ethnic studies, going to be teaching ethnic studies at UC San Diego. And I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, wrapping up my dissertation, and a friend of a friend asked me, well, so you've got this job, what is that going to mean? And I explained what the position was, she's not in academia. And explained, so you teach, she's in history, right? I'm like, yes. You're teaching ethnic studies? Yes. So, can you teach like normal American history courses. And it's a friend of a friend. And I was <laughs> and I used to back away from these kinds of, you know, confrontations with friends. But I just I just looked at her and said, I was under the presumption this is American history. And her response, well I mean I mean I really I mean I, I don't like I understand. This is American history. And just left it at that. Figured my teaching was done for that moment. Years later, at UC San Diego, one of the most powerful lessons I received was from an undergraduate. There was a weekly meeting for, um, it was open to anybody, but principally it was for black undergraduates, grad students, and faculty. <coughs> Met at Friday afternoon at 5 at the cross, uh, cross Cultural Center on campus. It was called the Black Campus Forum. And it was just an open meeting. There was no agenda. It was to check in what's going on in your life this week. And one day, um, uh, one of the students, female undergrad, I don't remember her name, was feeling aggrieved. And, she, and UCSD is a science campus, bi biological sciences. And she said, I'm fed up with walking into this classroom of 700 students and have people look at me almost with wondering, like, what are you doing here? The only black person in this entire class. And she went on like this for a while, and we heard her out. And this is a complaint we heard other times or a venting. And in this particular day, a young man named Clifford Marks, now living an interesting life, teaching English in Japan, and uh, he changed his name to Khalif al-Jahad. You can imagine what an interesting life he leads now, um, trying to travel. Um, uh, Clifford looked at the student and said, I don't understand the problem. And she repeated, he goes, no, I heard what you said, but I don't understand it. I've taken that class. And I walked in and had the same experience. All these faces looked at me. He goes, and I just presume they're looking because I was so beautiful. <laughs> and he ended it. And it was a transformative moment for me because he actually was doing the work that Professor Gladys was talking about, living with the presumption, dare he say, that he was exceptional. And that's why they wanted to see this exceptional young man. Um, this is a lesson I tell my students um, frequently when, as we all are called with frequency to come to sessions 
of grievances of undergraduates about deal, issues dealing with intolerance on our various campuses. We, we know this drill. Um, we play those roles. And students, African-American, Latino, Asian-American students at Yale, feel them agree for this reason or that, that they don't belong. And I try to drill it into their heads. Don't let anybody tell you you don't. You are. It's not a matter of belonging at Yale. You embody it. For all of its strengths and all of its weaknesses, you are Yale. And once you understand that, you've won more than half of the battle. You need to embolden yourself walking in the door that this is my room, too. This is my college, too. This is my classroom, too. This is my professor, as well. And that's the end of the conversation. Now, now that's a, 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 one might call an assertion of kind of an ethical way of living, um, that I will assert my own humanity at every moment, every uh, day. And certainly that assertion is exhausting, we need to, to support each other as much as we can. But to tell students that they have the right, it's a bizarre way of saying it, saying so I think you understand, that they have the right to assert their own humanity and presume that others will believe them. It's something to teach the students to do. And so, and again, echoing our, our, the, the panel's beginning, um, that work is, is never finished. Uh, and I think it's a critical part of at least my pedagogy. I, I don't teach American religious history. I, I teach social history, political history. Um, but there's something, well, I don't know, I would say fundamentally humane about walking around confident in the belief that we belong. Wherever it is that we may happen to be, that we belong. And sometimes that insistence comes at a cost of exhaustion. Sometimes that insistence comes at a, co at a cost of denial, a denial of what you're seeing around you all the time. Or, or it uh, comes at a cost of having to ignore the blabbering heads on television. Um, there are certainly costs to that ticket. Uh, but I dare say it's something we all as teachers have to make sure our students understand. They have the ability to cover that cost all the time and that we are there to back them up as much as possible. Stuart Hall, something akin to a, a floating uh, signifier, right, in the way that he talks about race, which is to say that um, I'm not sure that the human is where we want to base our claims about equality and freedom, right, because it's historically been contingent. So we know, for example, um, from the U.S. Constitution and the Three-Fifths Compromise that there was a way in which we were three-fifths human, and then we became fully human in the context of taxation and representation. There's a context when we think about um, the global south versus the global north in which um, people in the global south are human to the extent that they can provide um, you know, birth surrogacy, they're human to the extent that they can provide um, uh, organs for people in the global north, right? But that there's kind of limits to the humanity as far as human rights and the, the ability of people to integrate and for bodies to transfer to move across borders and the like. Um, you know, similarly with regard to, I think, black women in particular, there's a way in which black women are, you know, understood to be somewhat closer to nature, right? And so then less human. Um, and so there are ways in which there, there are kind of contingencies to the category of human that I think that are worth thinking about and, to, and that, it's, uh, that it may not be necessarily where we want to lay our claims today. And so I would say, somewhat similar to Professor Glove, that we don't need to plead the case, not only because the ticket's already been paid, but precisely also because 
I think it's, um, there's a way in which it's a game, particularly if you're talking about science and medicine, that can never be won on those terms. And I think um, echoing um, Professor is it, is it Zilch? Zilch. Zilch, Zilch, I'm sorry, um, it, it, you know, that, that certainly that Du Bois showed us in his life, his own frustrations with trying to make, to, to trying to plead about the categories of human vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, thinking about science and medicine and the like. So, um, with regard to that, I think we might want to suggest that, you know, that we don't want to throw out maybe something, the category of humanism, right, which provides us for a way of thinking about um, a kind of ethical relation to each other. Um, but I think that we might want to leave, a, leave, a, leave an open question the idea of the category of the human and maybe think um, about other kind of bases for relationships. And in that regard, I thought, um, and I was thinking in particular about um, Trisha Broke's work on on sexuality, but about the kind of intimate politics that she talks about in that book, in her book, Longing to Tell, um, and the way in which I was struck in the first panel about the use of the word encounters, right? Um, and I think in Trisha's book, she's more, I think she calls it maybe an intimate politics, so a way of thinking about an intimate politics that does recognize that the ticket has been paid, of course, right? That, they, that we are all human, but that is, um, but doesn't rely on the category of human because that's a kind of sex category. And I'll just say at last, it's particularly that's been a moment where um, the kind of consensus in the sciences, for example, around whether or not race is a biological category, gender is a biological category, that kind of, it's an example for us in which to rely on the category of the human as the category on which we make claims about freedom. So, you know, we're 99.9% .9 alike genetically, thus we all are human. Um, that, you know, that, that consensus held for a time, and now there's a lot of contestation and challenge around what that means both on technical grounds and on ethical grounds. And so um, I think historically over time, I guess my point is, is that how we've understood the human has changed, it's going to keep on changing, and so that it can't fully be our basis. Um, it can't be the, the terms on which we plead um, for our humanity and for humanism amongst people as, a, as an ideal. And uh, lastly, I would just say that like ideas of democracy, like ideas of freedom, in which um, African Americans have been, you know, sort of bringing to relief the kind of conflicts between what is the, you know, the, the real and the ideal. That I think the distinction I'm trying to draw between the category of the human, um, not the actual real human being, but the category of the human and humanism is precisely this kind of distinction, right? Between what, what actually it, you know, the ideal of humanism um, and sort of the gap between uh, what in, uh, real life looks for and what looks like for people, particularly African. Thank you for such an opening to this larger conversation about what it means to be human. And maybe before we uh, open it up for people to uh, assemble at the microphones, and we do encourage open conversation, there might be some further reflections on the part of panelists based on their colleagues' remarks. Would anybody like to weigh in on anything to amplify something? Something you didn't have time to amplify or questions you'd like to respond to? And we also encourage people to come up to the mic while this process is going on. I'm sure you want to give up on the category? <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I ask is, is, is that uh, it, 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 it has interesting implications for a certain conception of, of, of liberalism in Europe. Right? So how we think about rights and schools and all that. Um, and I don't know if you just simply shifted the ambiguity. And one could make the claim, right, that there is, in fact, uh, slippage in the very ways in which categories have been deployed for thinking about uh, the political status of people, of persons. Right? That those categories have been used to reproduce all sorts of heinous things. Right? And those categories, nevertheless, have been also to respond to this. Right? And so to then say right, that the category of human, because of its slipperiness or its sullied past, ought to be, I don't think you, you, you made this wrong. You just said we ought to be, we, we, at one point you said we ought to put it aside, and at another point you said uh, we ought not hang all our things on, uh, all our, 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 our everything on. Um, I'm just wondering about the of that uh, 
or a rights discourse and whether whether that intimate politics or how whatever counter or alternative we have would be subject to the same kind of Right, yeah, sure. I mean, there, you know, there's a way in which, as, as we're having right now, this is kind of an academic conversation, so I apologize for those who aren't um, academics necessarily. I mean, which is why I was saying the category can I not see them. I mean, I was trying to draw a kind of conceptual distinction that was maybe, you know, a kind of ideal, you know, um, ideational thing more than the actual, you know, what a human being is. I guess the point that I was trying to make, and as you were making it a bit stronger than I was, is that, um, I, you know, I think the project of trying to, that there's failures all around us. Now, I'm not saying that it's silly, but, you know, the, the ways in which we can have a conversation about human rights, the way that we, the, the ways in which it's difficult to have a conversation about health as a right that all humans have, right, says to me that, um, not that it's a failed project necessarily, but that it's one that bears interrogating and that we need to think about other strategies at the same time. Um, and so, and I think that to get so caught up in, you know, I'm a human, we're all around us, there are these exceptions, right? You know, this is Avangan, right? The kind of stated exception, the naked life, the bare life, there are all these kinds of exceptions in everyday life um, that show us that the human cannot necessarily, with that category story, be the place where we place all of these ideals, you know. Um, so, which is to say that, that, that we want to look for alternatives, even as we insist upon, and this is, a, again, a distinction I was, uh, you know, I was trying to sort of elevate, still thinking about humanism, right, um, uh, as a, you know, but without, but having different kind of foundational basis for that, potentially. Let, let me just, I want to ask Professor Johnson, um, can you concretize for me the examples that you the John's talking about is exception. Make it really strong. Oh, sure, sure. Um, I was being more provocative, provocative than I thought I was being, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I mean, one of the examples I would point that I wrote and I, that I um, tried to raise with you that I can say a bit more about is the, the, you know, there are bodies that are, there are human bodies that um, it's okay to do certain things with, and there are human bodies that we would never abuse in certain ways. So, Certainly, the, you know, the um, criminal justice system is one example of this, but there's a way in which um, that certain kinds of humanity, certain kinds of humanness, rather, are, are brought to bear in particular, particularly oppressive projects. So um, the examples I was trying to talk about here are sort of like organ trafficking and organ donating, right? So that's all about the particular human, right? But it's not, you can't base any kind of claim. I mean, you're, so um, the kind of, tr the trafficking in our organs, for example, about sort of an exchange between humans, but you, I don't, my claim would be that you can't necessarily make a claim to freedom based on that, a, a kind of notion of humanness that, that is about taking somebody else's organs or using them to birth carry it. Um, does that speak okay. that more clear? Yeah. And I think what you're saying, I mean, there's, there is, again, the issue that all of what you're saying in terms of organ trafficking in terms of surrogacy, all those are bound up in power relations that where some folks have the means to control and coerce, even if it's the kind of coercion that involves saying, I can pay you 20 times your annual income to just simply bear a child, um, to off to, to enslave in certain ways, to utilize bodies in certain ways. And this is what I mean about the constant contestation of being human that requires that we give voice. You're talking about sort of the facts and the consequences of this treatment, and I'm saying the evidence of those facts and con con consequences of mistreatment require <coughs> that we must constantly give voice to the importance of folks being fully humanized and therefore having full control of us. Right, and I was also just trying to talk about the, and I, and I won't say any more, the kind of dual process in which you're, so you're um, denying somebody's rights or you're laying claim to their bodies based on their human and humanism, right? But the, the second part of that I was trying to, 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 to talk about was then people then don't have human rights, right? So there's a way in which the human works doubly both to oppress, you know, in kind of two forms, right, in a kind of carceral form, right, as well as, well as in the form of that of rights, right, in a kind of more liberal way of thinking. And so um, 
when you have that double whammy, I think for me is a moment where I, I, I think that we should take pause and say, you know, is the kingdom where we want to, do we want to plead, as you were saying, on the level of the kingdom, or do we want to try to think about alternative <coughs> paradigms for thinking about um, sort of equality and so on? Why don't we uh, open up this rich conversation to <laughs> the human beings out here? And we'll. <laughs> We'll start with this sister here. Please you can, uh, give your name and your affiliation, however you see affiliated. Speaking of my children. Precisely the point that I was trying to make. Uh, that is to say, uh, it is in the doing, it is in the living, uh, it's in the doings and sufferings of these peculiar folk <coughs> that we gain some insight. We can abstract from their doings and sufferings, right? some insight into what it means to make one's way through this difficult journey called life. And so part of what we have to do those of us who reflect on the, that doing and suffering, right, is to reflect on it in such a way that shows fidelity to its complexity, to its nuance, to the contradictions inherent in those doings and, and sufferings. Because as we begin to tell a complex story and write complex histories, uh, engage in complex sociological studies and political accounts, uh, we can reveal the very ways in which these peculiar folk, right, have made sense of their lives under absurd conditions for the most part. Does that make sense? And so part of what I've been trying to suggest is that we give attention to the doings and sufferings, right? Understanding that those doings and sufferings are reflective of uh, individuals, persons, uh, engaged in sense-making. And that sense-making uh, offers resources, right, for others. And once we proceed from that, uh, then perhaps um, we can put aside some, some questions. How can I put this? Some questions are just best left aside. And I think this question of whether or not I'm human or not uh, is best left aside. And to the person who asks me that question or puts me in a position where I have to answer it,
Yeah, I, I took the question, um, I won't be the panelists telling personal stories, but the, um, I took the question from um, um, not necessarily about our public projections as intellectuals or scholars or pastors, but also in the more private, intimate ways in the truth of our lives. And, I, you know, I, I'm a serious believer in um, setting examples by doing, you know, by living. And I think part, I mean, I agree with, with everything, once again, that Professor Glaub just said, but there's also, um, we can't lose sight of the fact as we go to get another meeting to, to talk about these issues um, or, you know, call, you know, tell the dean, I've got to talk, this is really urgent. You know, we can't lose sight of the fact that we have, you know, a partner at home or children in the house or something like that or, or parents that we need to, you know, pay attention to or um, something that gives you joy and something you can give joy to as well. There, we can't lose sight of the fact that our most important teaching job is for the children, the next generation. Um, and it's, it's not always about how to be in, in um, a particular case, how to grow up to be uh, a strong black man, let's say. It may not always... I hope it's not always about it. I hope it's about how to be a decent human being, how to treat somebody with care and love and respect, you know, how to uh, look out for somebody. I don't care what they look like, who's having a tough day. You know, there, there are very intimate ways in which we can take care of each other. Now, that's not going to change the global questions um, or the, the profoundly depressing philosophical questions we are presenting in this panel. But if we don't do those small, intimate things, we've given up everything. Yes. Um, I'm Dr. Aaron Lewis. I'm writer, rose writer, uh, uh, pastor, author, that kind of, kind of thing. Um, one of the things that uh, comes to mind when I think about this uh, question is that throughout antiquity, we have um, given the oppressor the lawful responsibility of defining what is human. And that's a very dangerous thing to do because no one can really define what being human is because human is something that is not really tangible. If it were, then we as a people collectively would have been destroyed many years ago. Uh, being human is a spirit or it's an essence. And that's something that I'd like you to address because um, we don't have to defend spirit. It is what it is. It's, it's almost a metaphysical reality. And so if we look at it from a sheerly scientific viewpoint, then we'll um, try to quantify and qualify what it means to be human when we really don't have a real grasp on it because no one really knows. I, I agree with you. I think that's, um, that's another alternative. I mean, that's just, you know, it's not, I'll, I, I think precisely yes. I mean, I would agree with you that there needs to be other spaces that we can think about foundations on which we have ethical responsibilities to each other, and certainly, you know, the, the, the spiritual or religious basis is one of those, for sure. I'm proud to recognize the next questioner, commenter, Dr. Anthony Reddy, who has come all the way from the University of Birmingham in the UK. Dr. Reddy. <laughs>
whole tenor of, of the conversation. And, and if we're not careful, we end up actually sort of simply verifying some existing structures that are very strongly exhibited within black religion. That, that we fight this with all our being, but then defend patriarchy and sexism exactly on the same models that racism exists itself. I'll tell a personal story. <laughs> <laughs> I was invited to speak for a school of bishops in a new denomination, which I won't name at this moment. But, <laughs> and I actually forget what the topic was to which I was supposed to speak, but I did what I was supposed to do, and we got to the question and answer period. And one of the bishops in training raised his hand and asked me to speak about the importance of male covering for women clergy. And male covering, in other words, if, if you're a woman in ministry, you've got to belong to a church that, you know, has a male head to cover you, 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 you hear where we're going. And, and some of the bishops in training in the room were women, and they're like, looking up. And I just looked at them, and I, I, I didn't do what I wanted to do, which was to say, not much. You know, give one of those taciturn answers that next question, I didn't do that. Because I was there to teach and try to deal with the structures of sexism in the, in the black church, etc. So I looked at them and I said, the scriptures that you are utilizing to argue for the importance of male covering are the same scriptures that folks utilize to argue for our enslavement forever. Yeah, yeah. And they looked at me and nobody said another word and I have never gotten another invitation. <laughs> <laughs> but this is something the men don't get. And yet, <coughs> the utilis, you know, the, the, again, it, it's a tool and I think one of the things that Professor Johnson and I are both operating within the back of our minds, and I may be making a presumption here, but sociologists think of something called the social construction of reality. We know how much human effort it takes to get any particular definition of the situation going, and that that human effort can involve volumes and centuries of accumulated work and knowledge, because human beings do that. They accumulate stuff, and they pass it on. And they build on it. That's, that's what we do. We, you know, and this is one of the things I'm not willing to let go of into the category of humanity because I also think of it in anthropological terms. Our tool making gets us into a lot of trouble. Um, Octavian Butler said it so well. We get into so much trouble because we are both intelligent and hierarchical. If we were only hierarchical and not very bright and not intelligent, we'd be okay. You know, or if we were only intelligent but not hierarchical. You know, we were just all intelligent and busy sharing our knowledge equally around the campfire every once in a while. And the, 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 the one little person who's busy doing all the um, creative stuff in the back of the cave who doesn't like to talk to other people, you know, comes up and, you know, the, you know, the people who had Asperger's syndrome before they discovered Asperger's syndrome comes up and shares his or her knowledge and say, oh, okay, we were all sharing. We would be fine. But she said it so well. We are both hierarchical and intelligent. And we have been doing that for so long. And once we figure out how to get on top of somebody else and use them, we <coughs> work very, very hard. We make whole industry out of that. And that is the problem. That is where that, the ability to contest someone's humanity comes in. And in this last half millennium, with this awesome monster that is rooted in the slave trade. And, and, and until the whole world stands back and says, okay, we have all been affected by this. You will not understand that. 
And that's why I say I, I'm looking more at a, a sort of moral responsibility of every human being to hold up everybody else's humanity. So it, 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 it's a, you know, in, in terms of pleading my case, I, you know, I'm like Eddie, you know, I, 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 I can say H and double hockey sticks is the best of us. <laughs> my name is Yolanda Pierce, Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, two things to restore a bit of humanity to my colleague, Eddie Glaude. He's a full professor, not an associate professor. I just, just wanted to note that because I wanted you to full professor. <laughs> um, I know we are trying to hold the tension of the concrete and the academic and the scholarly. So um, since I get to speak this afternoon, I'll talk about the concrete right this moment. There is power in the term human. And there's power in the term human being. And I want to explicitly state that so that we're not so quick to quite dismiss it. At any point in time in which black women are called hoes or whores, then aspects of their humanity are ripped away. In which African Americans are called criminals and that there's a conflation between criminality and African Americanness, then we have seen elements of humanity being stripped away. When, we, when our children are known as misfits or brats or special ed, whatever we do when we use language, we are either offering or stripping away or contesting some aspects of humanity and humanness. So I offer just a different look, right, as someone invested in language, that the term human and why this is necessary in terms of continuing to plead our cause is because the alternative is that people call us out of our names. Mm -hmm. And so the restoration of our names, at least that part of that conversation, has to do with our humanity. There are other aspects to it as well, and I acknowledge those, but I just want to say let's not be quick to throw away the, contest, the contestation of humanness and that absolutely important term, I am a human being. I am a child of God. I am invested with the soul because I think in light of the fact that there are so many other labels, so many other rubrics placed upon people of African descent, we can't forget that there is still some power in the use of that term. I, I think, I think, thank you so much, Sister Um I, I, want, I want to press back a little bit. It's going to sound like I'm contradicting myself, but I want to, I want to think about this in solidarity. That is to say, one could make a certain kind of anti-humanist argument, right? And that is to say, if we're going to engage in a kind of, this is why I was worried about the moment where you said you wanted to embrace humanism, let me explain what I mean. And that is to say, one could give an account of the emergence of bourgeois ideology, right? That's at the heart of, of, of the formation of liberalism, right? Where there are certain categories that reproduce certain meanings that generate the kinds of hierarchies that we all want to speak against, right? And so there's a kind of skepticism about the invocation of rights discourse, right? There's a kind of skepticism about a certain kind of appeal to the universality of, of something called humanity or whatever, right? And it's because those categories reproduce meanings that then, in fact, reproduce the very kind of hierarchical relations we think we are arrayed against. And so there's an argument that when we draw on rights discourse, right, that that discourse presupposes a certain kind of subject right? A certain kind of conception of the individual that's at the heart of the problem, right? That's at the heart of the problem of our relations of production, that's at the heart of the problem in terms of patriarchy, that's at the heart of the problem of white supremacy. So there's an argument to say, well, we need to not necessarily lay aside those terms, right? But we need to be very, very mindful of how appeals to notions of individualism, appeal to notions of humanity, appeal to notions of rights, in fact, undermine Right? It becomes a kind of performative contradiction for those who are actually speaking against class, who are actually speaking against racism, who are actually speaking against uh, 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 white supremacy and the like. You get the point. And so I want to take seriously that sort of claim, right? But I'm also very, very skeptical of moving to a relinquishing rights discourse at this point, right? Just as when we get gain access to a future for a right? I think rights discourse continues uh, to be very powerful. Maybe it's because at the heart of it, I see the power in a certain kind of liberal understanding of the individual. That doesn't mean I'm just you know, liberal in, in the kind of milquetoast sense of what Americans mean by it, right? But I, I, I see the importance of the kind of conception of the individual that comes out of it at this moment that I'm not ready to relinquish. Uh, and so I think we can have a debate on the merits of a kind of humanist position, 
uh, over and against the merits of the humanist position of why the categories uh, might matter and why they might get us in trouble. That's a little abstract, but I think it's a way of getting to or framing uh, the more concrete questions about how do we address general uh, unjust practices that re result in the, the dishonoring uh, and the stripping of dignity of, of, of people we care most about. We have about 20 more minutes, and I just wanted to sum up at least how I see it. I think that uh, from the larger question of when will we be able to stop pleading our case that we are humans, we sort of had three different <coughs> emphases. One was, uh, yes, we must continue pleading our case. Uh, two, no, we don't have to plead our case. We just simply live as human beings. In fact, don't even discuss it. And thirdly, there's been to say, well, what we need to do is change the terms of the debate from the starting point about our humanity to some other tertium quid, some other third way which we have yet to clarify precisely, but um, it's open for debate. Let me just say, I want to pick up Professor Bloss' point. I think it's very important how he linked the specificity of the discussion, the definition of human to historical and cultural context. Because if we were in the People's Republic of China now, we might be discussing human in a different way. If we were in, 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 in Fidel and Raul's Cuba, we might be discussing the question of human way. And so in a very sense, Although we say we're African and black Americans, we might be really be in a very American way talking about what it means to be human. Oh, Dr. West, good to see you. Oh, good to see you, by the way. Appreciate your words on behalf of us there, my light on television. But uh, I want to come back to my, my dear uh, elderly wise sister in terms of her invocation of Jesus Christ, which echoes Professor Townsend Jilt's point about slaves saying, I'm a child of God. And then the sense-making of black folks, Professor Ball has been talking about. Because let, let, let's go back to uh, Lorraine Motel 40 years ago. That isn't it the case that as a Christian, Brother Martin was not pleading a case, but bearing witness. And in his commitment to not being human, but to his understanding of the cross, him lying there in the blood, he's most human because he loves so much and he sacrificed and suffers so much. So when you look at it from a Christocentric way, that's how I look at it, because I look at it through Christian lens. So I understand secular humanism is a particular ideology with idolatrous tendencies that downplays what it means to be in action, in love, promoting justice, and in a world that we live in, more than likely crushed. And as you are crushed, that's you on your cross, which makes you most human because you're committed to something grander than the human. That's a very different way of looking at it. That's why color blindness can never be part of your perception. You are love struck. You're not color blind. If you're linked to the, to the cross and to, and, and, and to being a Christian, you're trying to love everybody. You're not trying to be colorblind, but you can't love them unless you embrace their color and their culture and their history. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a different orientation. And if you understand to be human as being just descriptive and scientific and on the normative level, everybody just getting along in some restless place as opposed to wade in the water, God don't trouble the water, all the transformation and struggle is in the mess, in the trouble, in the water because the cross is waiting for you. It's a very different way of looking at this. But that is the way that so much of the best of our ancestors have bequeathed to us. So the notion of pleading humanity is always going to be held at arm's length, but you have to bear witness to it in the face of dehumanization, which is always already there. And the question is, Brother Tavis was telling me in, in, in dialogue is, what resources do we allow for folk, especially ordinary folk, who have to choose between either resisting or becoming well-adjusted to the injustice? Yes. Yes. Um, my name is Lorena Mass. Um, I'm Emmanuel School Religion of Long Island. Um, my name is Lorena Mass from the Emmanuel School of Religious a, a Seminary I attended. Um, okay, my, my statement is, as with the story of the prince among slaves, um, 
as the prince was it eventually acknowledged that he, he was truly a prince, he was still kept on the plantation and was utilized there on that plantation uh, in American history. Um, we'll, we'll, in that mindset, in that mindset, even though, yes, eventually he was received as a prince, or as acknowledged by a white man that he was a prince, yet they still kept him. And eventually, he got to go way later on, he got to go back to his home country in Africa. Will being human be enough is the question I have. Will, uh, will, will, if we are pleading to being human, will be, being human be enough to bring healing to this society, or to bring the upheaval, or to remove the system, or to move the system of the oppressor who historically is built on the premise that we, as a black people, or as a people of African descent in America, that we are not human, historically built on that premise uh, that we are not human, which will, uh, will this enable us to um, receive the justification necessary to operate in our true purpose and our true calling in the USA or, and also in the world. Um, you know, there's, I suppose there's many different ways to answer that question. One way I'm going to approach it is, is less philosophical and more practical, just for the moment. And I, and I would encourage anybody else to augment the answer, to certainly not the end of it. Um, when will it be enough? When, at what point, you know, if, when will it be enough? I suppose it will be enough. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to get invested in the everyday battle over whether I'm human or not, but it will be enough when people aren't hungry. Mm -hmm. And on a day like today, they're dry. And they're warm through New England winter. I mean, that's when we begin to get into the space for me is when it's going to be enough. And then we can get on to other more enduring kinds of questions. I mean, I think the question, as much as, I mean, I, I joked with Emily Towns who sent me the email with the question, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This is going to be a headache. Um, <laughs> as much as the question is valuable and we have to keep asking that or thinking about the question, um, we can't let it be a distraction either. Um, and that's where, I, that's where I really come down. It can't be a distraction from the fact that while we're fighting over um, in the Department of African American Studies, you know, the deep philosophical questions of our own humanity, people are just hungry. Yeah. And I don't think we really, I, don't, I mean, I link being human with being humane. Um, and I don't think we really are humane until we take care of ourselves. And ourselves, I mean, in the most global and expansive way. Is that going to lead to the Rodney King phenomenon? Why can't we all get along? Or? Thank you. 
Response in terms of Rodney King, um, I think the if you look at the King episode, you can at least say it's an episode of excess, excess speed, excess drugs, and excess force. Um, now, if we're rapping to be free as sort of like we can all do what we want to do, I think we have to realize that to be free does not mean to embrace excess. This is one of the faults of American character. I think you know we can never have too much, um, and. I think that's one of the faults, as in the faults of, well, there's many faults in Rodney King, so you can't get into that. Um, but, the, but the notion of to be free, the way I take it, is also to, to ask yourself constantly, um, is this enough? And is that, and does someone else need something else also? Um, and it's, it's living with restraint, I think. But we're not trained to do that in this country at all. But I think that's a critical component of being free, of knowing when to stop. I want to uh, thank Professor Holloway for leading by example. Uh, the issue of constructing our humanity and preparing for assault. I, um, my dad is 88 years old, so that gives you an idea, a World War II veteran, that gives you an idea of his generation. And I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in a neighborhood that was heavily multi-ethnic, and when I say multi-ethnic, um, my friends would have arguments with their parents and grandparents in Greek, in Italian, loud. I would say to them, you know, and they would be kind of loudness back to their grandparents or parents that if I was that loud and vocal with my grandmother, I would have a jaw ache, right? But they would always be, it would be a yard distance between them while they were screaming back and forth in a language I couldn't understand. I would say to my friend, is it about me? And they came around, no! And then they go on screen, and I found out later on, yeah, it was about me. But we had a conversation one time, about third or fourth grade, we're sitting in the playground, going around, I'm Irish. I'm Italian. I'm Greek. And I'm like, I went home, because I didn't know what to say. I just knew I was colored, because you know the time period we're talking about. And I went home and said, Daddy, what are we? Now, of course, Abraham Joshua Heschel tells us, what is the wrong question? It's who are we? We are not things. We are who's. We are humans. I mean, the, his book, Who is Man? I, I highly recommend it. But my dad pulls out an atlas and points to the west coast of Africa. You know what time period this is. We weren't black yet. <laughs> and, and says, we come from somewhere along in here. And being my good dad, who always read me good stories, he proceeded to tell me a story that when he got through, I was convinced I was descended from royalty. Okay? Now, you know, as a little kid, you know, I read the fairy tale, The Princess and the Pig. I knew to go back to the playground and shut up about the royalty part. Put a pin in it. My parents moved to Middleborough, Massachusetts. Going to lunch, sophomore year of college, uh, of high school, the white boys would line up on either side of the walkway, shove me back and forth, and call me racial slurs 
that I didn't even know existed till we moved to Middleborough, Massachusetts. I had heard the N word and a few other things, but they had a whole. And when I went to the principal and complained about it, the principal didn't put, refuse to believe me. He said, "Well, maybe you just need it. I, I, why don't I walk you to lunch?" And of course, that makes everybody angry when the principal has to walk you to lunch every day. The principal who played Mr. Interlocutor in the annual minstrel show that was done in blackface <laughs> at the Lions Club, which was all white. Okay? And he was Cuban American. Okay, remember this is pre civil rights, pre uh, civil rights act. So they couldn't get to me. So one day they waited after school. My mother picked me up and they tried to run us off the road in a car. But let, I, I'm telling you all this is because when I was going down that aisle with the, the assaults that were happening to me. I can remember in my head holding myself up and saying, I don't know who they're doing this to. Because Daddy had told me the royalty story so well that I still believed it. And when I got to college and found out that Daddy couldn't quite know what ethnic group we were a part of, you know, the, how we learned what we don't know, etc. I, I had to call him up on the phone and say, do you know the part you said about being descended from chiefs, and, 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 and he laughed at the other end. And you could imagine this big moon face saying, "Well, it helped, didn't it?" <laughs> uh, that, and, and I, I'm saying, in terms of constructing, preparing me for that assault, and making me able to fight back. Now, there's a whole lot of other stuff that went with it because you know, fight in AACC, we knew how to oppose. Um, you know, that they have to threaten through the school system. And it was actually the police. When they say that police cannot stop harassment and violence towards students, let me, can I just finish the story so you know what happened? Because they did, they did put a stop to it. The principal wouldn't do anything. When the kids tried to run us off the road, my mother was driving, she was a new driver and very stubborn. She refused to be intimidated. And while I'm getting hysterical in the car, she says, write down your license plate number. So I had to write down their license plate number. When we went home, my father, who happened to be an alcohol and tobacco tax agent for the IRS, revenue chasing stills. Got up at four o'clock the next morning, went down to the police station, because all the police knew, because whenever they did a raid on a still, they had to coordinate with the local police department, told them what was going on, gave them the kids license, and they waited until nine o'clock in the morning, went in and arrested them out of school. Took them down to the police station and said, we're gonna file this case. The operator of the car is responsible for what goes on in the car. If there is one more name call, if there is one more word said, one more hand put on her, we will pull this case, take you to court, and you will lose your driver's license. And in a rural area, <laughs> they told the, pet, the principal, do not walk her to lunch today. And I walked out. Have you seen that cartoon where they test the German shepherds by marching the little kitten in front of them to see if they, they run the train? That's what happened that day. And I was never called another name in Little Bell, Massachusetts again. But the point is that you build up in such a way that the enemy cannot tear down. And that is so important. And we learn not only to hear the assaults on ourselves, but when they start on others who are not of our group. It's like music appreciation. You can hear it and interrupt it. Just really quickly, my example has always been James Baldwin, who's principal task has been to raise, was to raise the babies. And how Baldwin took the Emersonian uh, challenge of self-creation, self-invention, and self-reliance, and yoked it to this serious uh, encounter with history and our dead. And how that joining generated the kind of armor requisite, at least on his view, uh, to sustain us uh, in the midst of of, of all of this chaos. And I say that because I didn't have a father like that. Uh, I thought my name was Lil Nigga. Most of the time I grew up. Right? And I think a lot of brothers and sisters grew up in households where this kind of armor wasn't available. And so there's resources to heal brokenness and anger and dysfunction out of which many of us come. And I think Baldwin is a great example, just a little quickly, of, of a resource to think about how to affirm who you are 
uh, without becoming obsessed with uh, defending that group in relation to somebody who will reduce you to a wall. Yes, please. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Alexander. I teach here at Yale. Uh, uh, two things. The, the strain of conversation about freedom made me think of all of the responses of African American poets to <coughs> these questions. Um, and so I'm thinking of uh, Robert Hayden's Frederick Douglass poem. Uh, when it is finally ours, this thing, freedom, needful to man as air, usable. When it belongs at last to all, when it is brain matter, diastole, systole, when it is more than just the gaudy mumbo jumbo of politicians. This man, this Douglas, he is to his knee. This man shall be remembered. No, not with statues rhetoric, but with the lies thrown out of his life, fleshing, what a choice, fleshing the dream of the beautiful and useful thing. I, 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 I suppress that a little bit, um, but I thought that it would be useful to have that on the table. And I've also been thinking about um, a few uh, iconic moments uh, moving through history that we're all familiar with that might give us an interesting litmus test or a gut check about how do we define plea and witness, what Dr. West describes as a kind of a witnessing. So beginning with that iconic engraving of the slave on his knees, am I not a man? Right? Who's, who's making that, that plea? And then moving forward, and of course on today, uh, the iconic signs of the Memphis sanitation workers' strike that brought Dr. King there in the first place because their working conditions were so inhuman, right? Um, and that, that sign said, what? I am a man. But it said, I am a man. That underline. Did anyone ever think about that underline? That always fascinated me. I am a man. So that that emphasis on am felt very, very important, uh, I, I think, in looking at those signs and thinking, is that witness or is that a plea? Then Reverend Jackson, uh, I think, riff on that later on with I am somebody. Mm. And what's so important about that, of course, is that the call and response has always been built in to that phrase. So I am, you have to come back with somebody. So the, 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 the claim to humanity is not just individual, it is immediately collective. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, Barack Obama's so-called race speech. Uh, how do you feel when you're watching that? Um, I felt that it was remarkably and brilliantly not a plea. Um, and that that was a, a part of the measure of its tremendous power. Um, but I think it's one of those moments that can be read um, through the lens of pleading or witnessing, or perhaps something else. So I wondered if any of you had any thoughts about those like, iconic moments or any others. Brilliant as always, Dr. Alexander. Um, I, I just would say it struck to me that they're not only witnessing, but they're assertions, right? And I think that's a different, I guess I want to, I want to recognize that, that, that's the, that the, the underlying, the underscore for am is an assertion of being. And um, that, you know, I am in agreement with you that we want to bracket the, con the plea and the, con and the debate and, and make particular assertions that allow us to have, and my third way I, I thought was somewhat different. As a kind of intimate politics of either the Trisha Rose, right? Which is in some, which is a kind of, you know, that Jonathan put more pragmatically, the way that we ethically deal with each other in the day to day. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've, for those who weren't here, I've got to go, but I, I'm sorry for that. But this, I want to give my one last half a sentence, and that is the, the, um, being at a place like Yale, you were surrounded by privilege. There's no, there's no if, ands, and buts about it. And it's fascinating anthropologically to study privilege. Um, because so much is built up, I mean, yes, there's the economic privilege, we understand that, but a lot of it is built on a simple declaration. You know, I'm just, you know, it's, well, I walk around just because, because I can, I mean, I should be here. This is, this is just where my mommy and daddy, and this is just, this is what I do. And I think it is transformative when people who look like this room simply walk around with, now, in a progressive sort of way, I'm privileged too. You know, a presumption that, um, that it goes beyond an assertion, goes beyond, certainly goes beyond a plea. You know, that is, 
that it's just written in the way you carry yourself and the way you're being. <coughs> that, again, as I began, it's like, this is my, well, it's not even this is my space, too. So it's like, well, of course. I mean, of course it's my space, too. What's the issue? That, I think, is a, if we get to that spot, in a progressive sort of way, that does not, that's not built upon denying those folks don't belong here either, which is, a, that's hard work. Um, then we're someplace special. Uh, yes, Dr. Peter Paris, Princeton. I want to um, thank the panelists for all their contributions to this question. And I felt the urge um, to make the comment that um, we, <coughs> we have always done more than simply plead our case. And that's why we are, we have survived. Um, we have demonstrated our humanity by overcoming the various hindrances and obstacles that were militating against us. And that's why we survived. We would not have survived if we had not overcome. And uh, this whole, you know, the motto of the civil rights movement that we shall overcome in this 40th year uh, is important to keep that in mind. And that we have, we have overcome in simple ways by teaching our children that they are just as good as anyone else. And didn't we all hear that? At some point, that we're just as good as anyone else. Now, not everybody else believed that. But it was important for those who did well by us to tell us that. And also, we have overcome by teaching America how to be human. The presupposition being that we knew something about how to be human. But those who oppressed us did not know how, not only how to treat us to be human, but how to become human themselves and how to rid themselves of the inhumanity. And that's been part of our struggle and contribution to this civilization, I think, from, from day one. Towns has been really interesting in terms of how she's been formulating the questions. Uh, in the first panel, we I, I focus on two words, uh, that, you know, makes and today, right? And in, in those two words, we get a sense of the kind of historicity, that is to say, the kind of historical production of black bodies, right? Which is really, which is really interesting. Right. And in this question, I focused on the word plead. Right. That predicate generates all sorts of problems. Sure. What we've been trying to do over the is to kind of think about how we might change the present. And what does it mean to witness one's humanity? What does it mean to assert one's humanity as opposed to plead? Uh, and I think we all, I think, we come to a consensus that we reject that predicate as a way of characterizing what we've been doing. Um, we have about two more minutes, so we're hoping that the questions will be more questions and those more questions will be shorter questions. And we'll just, yeah, we'll just take them off. Great suggestion. And the panel can uh, respond accordingly. So please, we'll, yes. How about an amendment? <laughs> I am Bernice Kosey Pulley, and I am a third member of that other country called Mississippi. <laughs> I just wonder if Professor Alexander would permit me to add another icon. The year is 1848, before men, women, blacks had the right to vote. The speaker is Sojourner Truth, and her icon was, ain't I a woman? Uh, 
good afternoon, or if it's still morning, good morning, everybody. My name is Regine Romaine. And I think for me, this question is, is interesting, but I really would like us to kind of elevate it just a tad, really in considering, one, there is no need to plead our humanity. The moment that we're born, we're human. We, we're here, but that's only part of our existence. And I would really encourage us to think, you know, what does it mean to be a child of God? If we talk about the strength of black religion, the strength of black people, the reason why we don't, it's not about being here at Yale as an example and we deserve to be here. We are here, we're everywhere. And I think that it's, it's significant to think about as a child of God, we're made in reflection of the creator. So for me, the question of being human is, is just the beginning. The higher question is when do we accept our God self? And that's what I would encourage everyone here to consider. It's beyond being human, it's beyond being black, it's beyond being white, it's beyond any of that. Can we accept what it means to be a child of God and to walk with, within our power, within our God self? That is what we have to teach our children. We are not better than anyone else, we are. We just, we are what we are. And being made in that image of God, being reflected of the water, the earth, the fire, all of that, that is all of what we are. And so we, each of us, each of us reflect that divinity. And so we are more than human. We are greater than, our, than anything that we could even imagine mm. being made in the image of God. Thank you. Yes, our last question. Yes. My name is Antipas Harris. I'm a uh, graduate of YDS and uh, also a doctoral candidate at Boston University. My brief question is, although the word plead seems pejorative, how can we embrace it in a positive light in reference to hip hop society and how the youth in our society are yet struggling in uh, self-identity and affirmation? As Dr. West has said, keeping it on the ground, how can we move beyond the impasse but always remain connected with the generations that need our prophetic voice in helping to change society towards the better. Thank you. Um, any remarks from the panel? Our town is going to be okay to extend it 30 seconds. Basically, I just wanted to say amen in response to the words witness image of God and prophetic voice and stress the importance of using and affirming all of it. That's all I want to say. But we, we need to embrace that. I would just simply echo uh, Dr. Dwight Hopkins that not only should we emphasize the image of God, we need to emphasize the mission of God. And, and to think about what does it mean to engage in the doing and the suffering and how that doing and suffering will offer up resources for others to imagine what it means to genuinely make one's journey from womb to tomb. In our experience, there's something about what it means to be human that is deep, that is profound, that is powerful. All of, all of the contradictions, all of the complexity, all of the nonsense, all of the mess, there's something in our experience that is powerful. And we just need to simply tell that story. Um, we'd like to thank our panel. <laughs> <laughs>